Okay, so hello and welcome to my microeconomics lecture series. Uh, here I'm going to be talking about price control. So this is going to consider various interventions by the government on markets, and we're going to look at the implications. Okay, so so far to the so far in the course, so far in the lecture series, we've defined consumers' willingness to pay and sellers' willingness to sell. So willingness to pay WTP, willingness to sell WTS. We said actually the willingness to pay was representable by the height of the demand curve, and we said actually the willingness to sell or the marginal cost was representable by the height of the supply curve. Anyhow, uh, this allowed us to build the concepts of consumer surplus and producer surplus. And we could put this on a graph. So we saw this graphically. That's probably the easiest way to see that. And we could, we could see our equilibrium picture so far, right? So we have willingness to pay. This is going to give us the height of the demand curve. Willingness to sell is going to give us the height of the supply curve. Actually, this area in between the demand curve and above the actual price paid, the market equilibrium price is consumer surplus. The area below the market price and above the supply curve is producer surplus. What's this area down here? This area down here is the costs, right? This is the cost to seller, to sellers. Okay, so this is our this is our standard competitive equilibrium. Well, suppose we want to affect we want to analyze the total effect of price changes on the market, particularly price changes caused by government intervention. Okay, so so far we've studied consumer surplus. That was again the difference between the value to buyers minus the amount buyers actually pay. Difference between this, the, the demand curve and the market equilibrium price or whatever is the actual price in the market. We studied producer surplus, difference between the amount received by sellers and the cost to sellers. Okay, so some of these two was total surplus. This is a measure of uh, the, the difference between the value to buyers and cost to sellers generated through this market activity. Okay, uh, now we can talk about efficiency. We'll do this before we start thinking about how price controls affect the market because ultimately we want to think about how the price controls affect market participants. And our window to this is, uh, is thinking about uh, welfare economics, thinking about efficiency. Okay, so let's define efficiency. Um, if an allocation of resources maximizes total surplus, we say that allocation is efficient. Um, if the allocation is not efficient, there are some potential gains to trade being left on the table. We can make some people better off without making anyone worse off. Okay, so how could this happen? Well, a couple ways. It's going to happen if a good is not being produced by the lowest cost sellers, if we have inefficiency in production, if we have higher cost sellers producing the good. Uh, so welfare and efficiency can be reduced if production is, not done, is done by the higher cost sellers. And if that's the case, we can increase welfare and efficiency by redirecting productive activities to the lower cost sellers, right? Whoever's got the lower cost is going to be able to um, is going to be able to add to our producer surplus at a higher rate than those with higher costs. Think about the relationship between costs, height of the supply curve, and producer surplus. Okay, so the other hand, we can get inefficiency if the good is not being consumed by the buyers valuing it most highly, as measured by willingness to pay. So in this case, efficiency can be enhanced, welfare can be improved if the goods are directed to buyers with the highest willingness to pay, if we direct those goods to those who are willing to pay the most for it. Now, there's an important assumption, implicit assumption economists are making here, and very often we kind of just gloss over this assumption, but basically when we say that efficiency requires that the goods are consumed by the, by the buyers who value it most highly, we are also implicitly assuming that willingness to pay is strongly correlated with ability to pay. You can think about how if that assumption is no longer valid, maybe ability to pay and willingness to pay come apart, then we have to think about something different here. Okay, so we, almost, we also might care about equality. Equality is the property of distributing economic prosperity uniformly through society. The um, question of efficiency actually concerns whether the proverbial economic pie, so to speak, is as big as possible. The question of equality concerns whether that pie is evenly sliced. So <laughs> one issue not shared by real pastries is that often trying to slice the pie into evenly sized pieces leads to a shrinking pie. So. All right. Now it turns out our competitive market equilibrium maximizes total surplus. So that was our picture so far. The competitive market equilibrium maximizes market efficiency. That means the same thing. Maximizing market efficiency and maximizing surplus, they're the same. So when the market clears, all goods are traded up to the point where willingness to pay equals willingness to sell. All goods are traded up to the point where the marginal benefit to consumers equals the marginal cost of producers. The market's not in equilibrium 
were it to rest at a point where willingness to pay was bigger than willingness to sell, why? Well, you should continue producing and continue trading until these become equal. Or it's also not an equilibrium if willingness to pay is less than willingness to sell. Then the costs exceed the benefits, so we should produce and trade less. Okay, so we can see this graphically. This is exactly that picture, right? So the point where willingness to sell equals willingness to pay, this is exactly our market equilibrium. So forgive the fact that this market equilibrium is drawn just epsilon above our, our crossing point, right? Okay, so the points to the left of the equilibrium, we know the demand curve is going to lie above the supply curve. Here's where willingness to pay, the benefit to consumers, the benefit to consumers is measured by the demand curve, is higher than the cost of sellers. Cost of sellers is measured by the supply curve. So we should continue producing optimally until we reach the equilibrium where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Beyond the equilibrium quantity, we have this other condition where the supply curve, the costs, love a, lie above the benefits, the demand curve. So here we've produced and traded too much. We should come back. Okay. All right. So we can take some insights about market outcomes. Free markets are going to allocate the supply of goods to the buyers who value it most highly as measured by willingness to pay. So keep in mind the ability to pay assumption. Um, free markets allocate the demand for goods to sellers who can produce them at the lower cost, as measured by willingness to sell. And free markets produce the quantity of good that maximizes the sum of consumer and producer surplus, maximizes total efficiency. Okay. All right, so suppose we already have a competitive market, we already have total surplus maximized, we have efficiency. What happens if the government imposes some price controls on the market? So let's think about this. Binding price controls and taxes, which I'll cover in a later lecture, are welfare reducing. They're going to reduce efficiency, introduce inefficiency into the market. Okay, so why? Well, let's see. All right, so first some definitions. Sometimes the government enacts price controls, legal price mandates. Um, so a price floor sets a legal minimum on the market price. A price ceiling sets a legal maximum on the market price. Now, it's important to realize the price floor does not stipulate a particular price, nor does the price ceiling stipulate a particular price. What the price floor and price ceiling do is they say uh, the price can go no lower than this amount in the case of a price floor. So there's many possible prices that the price floor will allow. There's just a limit as to how low the price can go. Same with the price ceiling. It does not stipulate a particular price. It just says the price can go no higher than this particular amount. So there's a whole range of prices that are fine under the price ceiling, those that are lower, right? Okay, so a well-known price floor is the minimum wage. The price floor can be binding or non-binding according to whether or not it prevents the market from reaching equilibrium. This is relevant in the case of the minimum wage. So how is a minimum wage going to affect a market? Well, it matters. Is this minimum wage going to be set above or below the current market equilibrium? Right? If the minimum wage is set below the market equilibrium, think about what a minimum wage is doing. It's saying this is a wage, we, the, the wage you're paying workers cannot go any lower than this amount. Well, if that level is stipulated below the market equilibrium, it doesn't matter. The market doesn't care. The market doesn't want the, market, the price to go that low. However, if the price floor is set above the equilibrium, then it matters, right? If we set a minimum wage above the market equilibrium price, then what's happening is the price wants to go lower, but the price floor is not allowing it. It's keeping the price from going down to equilibrium. In that case, we're going to have some distortion in the market, right? So the effects of a minimum wage depend very strongly on where it's located relative to the equilibrium. Okay, so let's consider the effect of a binding minimum wage, price floor set above equilibrium. First, we got to have some definitions sort of unique to the labor market. So uh, labor demand is actually firms. <laughs> Usually we think of demand as being the consumer side, people side, and we think of supply as being the firm side, right? Well, with the labor market, you know, intuitively or counterintuitively at first, it works a little bit differently. So labor demand is firms, right? Firms are buyers in the labor market. Firms are those hiring workers. So labor demand is firms wishing to hire workers. The amount of jobs can be interpreted as the quantity of labor demanded at a particular price. And here the price is just the wage. Labor supply. Supply is not firms in the labor market. Supply is workers, right? Workers are supplying their labor. They're the ones who are selling labor, right? So the quantity of labor supplied is the amount of workers who are interested in jobs at a particular wage. When the quantity demanded equals quantity supplied, 
just like any other market, the market's in equilibrium and there's no unemployment. So here's our picture. This is our demand for labor. This is labor demand in green. This is our firms willing to hire workers. Here's our supply for labor in purple. If there's no minimum wage, then the prevailing equilibrium wage is going to be just where demand, labor demand crosses labor supply. And this equilibrium quantity is going to be the amount of workers hired, right? Just some further uh, reminders. In this market, quantity supplied is the number of people wanting jobs. Quantity demanded is the number of jobs available. Okay. All right. When a minimum wage is imposed on the market, it might have the effect of creating unemployment. Matter of fact, if the price control is above equilibrium, for sure it'll cause unemployment. So I say this is true to the extent we believe the simple static supply and demand model does a sufficient job characterizing the situation. Minimum wage set above the market equilibrium creates unemployment, other things equal, that's what Ceteris Paribus means, because it prevents the market wage price from, clearing from adjusting downward to clear the market. So this is an important point. The minimum wage, in fact, any price control set, uh, set below the equilibrium would have no effect on the market. And I mentioned that originally, but suppose, suppose we set a minimum wage of like 25 cents an hour, right? That's far below the equilibrium wage in any labor market in the United States, right? Um, that would be a non-binding minimum wage because the equilibrium price is much higher. It just a minimum wage that low would have no effect on the market. It'd be non-binding. On the other hand, a minimum wage set at like $30 an hour, that'd be higher than most price, most, um, most equilibrium wages in the U.S., Definitely fifty dollars an hour for sure, um, and those would those would definitely have an impact, yeah, a, a, rather, a large one. Okay, so suppose we have a binding price floor. We have a binding minimum wage, right? So we have a price control. This is a price. This is a minimum wage uh, price floor above equilibrium. Clearly, here's our equilibrium. This is higher than the equilibrium. What do we know about equi above equilibrium prices? Well. Um, uh, sellers like above equilibrium prices. Buyers don't. And we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get a problem. We're gonna get a surplus because we're gonna have sellers more eager to participate in the market than buyers. Okay, we can actually see this right here, right? So at this binding minimum wage, this is saying the price can go no lower than this red line. Now the price wants to go. The wage actually wants to go all the way down to this equilibrium price, but the minimum wage does not allow it. it stops it here. So this means that we have stipulated a price at this level. So we want to find the quantity supplied and demanded at this particular level. Well, the quantity demanded is just where this price intersects the labor demand curve. It's this right here. This is the amount of jobs offered at that equilibrium or at the minimum wage. The quantity supplied, we find that by comparing the minimum wage, the price, the price, the, the price set by our binding price floor to our supply of labor. Here's our labor supply. This is the number of workers interested in working. All right, so there's a mismatch. There's a problem. Anytime there's a disparity between quantity supplied and quantity demanded, the actual market quantity is going to be the smaller of the two. So this is going to be the actual number of, uh, of jobs filled, quantity demanded. So since quantity supplied is bigger than quantity demanded, we have excess supply. We have unemployment. Okay. Now, I'll come back to this a little bit later in the slide, or maybe at the end of the slides, but not all this unemployment is equal. right? So the workers... Uh, between QD and the original equilibrium, who are part of this uh, surplus, those workers have lost their jobs. We don't feel so great about that. However, the workers that are lined up between the original equilibrium all the way out to this new quantity supplied, this portion of the surplus, we feel less bad about them because these are people that weren't bothering to be in the labor market at this lower price and have now been incentivized to want to work. So we feel less bad about them being unemployed because they didn't lose a job. Okay. So in this minimum wage example, there are winners and losers. Those who want to work and are employed are happy. They get a higher wage, so that's good. Those who were able to work at the equilibrium but now lose their jobs are very unhappy. Um, and evidence is pretty clear. Minimum wages are going to create some unemployment, but there might be some compelling reasons why, they, why we want to enact them even so. Uh, that's a that's a completely different question. Okay, so let's consider a price ceiling example, price gouging laws. So 
many, but not all states, have anti-gouging laws, which will limit the maximum increase on necessities to a certain amount in the wake of a disaster. So a typical law might prevent a price increase for ice, water, generators, blankets of more than 10% above the normal price. And typically, economists are going to believe that price gou anti-price gouging laws are a bad idea. Um, interesting paper by uh, philosopher Matt Zelensky on price gouging. So anyway, um, all right. So let's consider the market for ice bags, a good commonly affected by anti-gouging laws. So first we see a normal functioning market. Like think about how many bags of ice you have bought this week. Think about the, the demand, the market for ice bags. I don't know, like maybe if you, maybe if you need to, maybe you don't have an ice maker or if you're having a party or something, you might have a demand for ice bags. You're going camping, whatever. But standard, pretty typical demand for ice bags is probably relatively, uh, relatively minimal. So we have our equilibrium price, we have our, our, our equilibrium quantity. Here's our demand for ice bags. Uh, here's our supply for ice bags. Cool. So now a, a disaster strikes. The price ceiling is imposed on the market for ice bags. Ice bags are a necessity. So since the price gouging law prevents prices from adjusting upward to equilibrium, it creates a binding price ceiling. And the rationale is, well, this is going to prevent consumers from being taken advantage of. And then the question is, well, does this really help consumers? I mean, maybe, maybe not. So that's uh, another item for discussion. So let's consider what happens in the wake of the disaster. So here is our original equilibrium, right? Here's our original equilibrium. And we have our, our demand for uh, ice bags before the disaster. We have our supply of ice bags uh, before the disaster. Here is our anti-price gouging law. Remember I said, it, it, you know, typically they won't allow prices to rise more than 10%. Okay, well, during normal times, this has no effect. It's a non-binding price ceiling during normal times, right? Price ceilings don't let the price go any higher. This is above equilibrium. The price doesn't want to make it that high anyway, so this isn't going to affect trade. Now, suppose we have this disaster strike, and all of a sudden we have this massive rightward shift of the demand for ice bags. So now I put this in purple. It's a big rightward shift, because now nobody has power. Everybody wants needs ice. Okay, well, now we have a new equilibrium price. So suppose this is the actual equilibrium price where we allow the market to adjust. So were we to allow the market to adjust on its own, this would be the equilibrium price. Here's our new equilibrium quantity. Problem is, this anti-gouging law is actually not going to let prices rise this high, right? Price wants to be up here, but the anti-gouging law, it's a price ceiling. It doesn't let the price go any higher than this red line, though the price wants to be at the blue line. That's a problem, because at the red line, here's our quantity supplied, and here's our quantity demanded, right? Our quantity demanded is way out here, quantity supplied is way out here. So we get actually a relatively large uh, shortage, right? When quantity demanded is bigger than quantity supplied, the smaller of the two is how many is actually traded, it's this amount. And there's a big shortage, because quantity demanded minus quantity supplied, um, if if the, the difference between quantity demanded and quantity supplied, if the quantity demanded is bigger than quantity supplied, we have a shortage. And here we actually have a relatively large shortage. So actually, probably, the situation's worse than what I've drawn. It's probably in the wake of the disaster. Maybe when power goes out and uh, transportation networks are, are disrupted, maybe this supply for ice bags actually shifts to the left. Maybe it becomes more steep. Maybe it becomes more inelastic. Maybe it's actually perfectly inelastic, fixed at the amount of bags that were available at the time of the disaster. Whereas this picture could actually be pretty, the, maybe this price is actually relatively high. Um, okay. Okay. So clearly the price ceiling creates a shortage. Quantity demand is bigger than quantity supplied. The price ceiling prevents the price from rising to the point where the shortage would have been eliminated. So this creates a relatively drastic distortion in the market and creates incredible inf inefficiency. And then I said, yeah, realistically, the picture is probably more severe than what I've actually drawn. Probably also creates, uh, probably creates a massive uh, uh, shift in demand. Ah, actually, this slide I forgot to update. So just, yeah, probably also creates an increase in demand. Yeah, we drew the increase in demand. I should have said this creates maybe a leftward shift to supply. All right, so, uh, so disregard that. Um, okay, we're going to skip this part. This is sort of an old slide. 
Okay, yep. So economists cite many reasons against the anti-gouging um, anti gouging laws. One argument based on the belief that high market price would create an incentive for suppliers to flood the areas with goods. This is a pretty optimistic view, but it's possible. So the idea would be, well, maybe those coming from unaffected areas would bring trucks with supplies, you know, private sort of solution to the problem, drive to the affected area and sell at a profit. And when enough entrepreneurs did this, the price would come back down. Um, yeah, that's what happens in reality. Well, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of people trying to, cases of people bringing trucks with supplies, traveling to affected areas and being arrested. So oftentimes the goods are seized and not distributed. So, um, yeah, so, okay, so there's some, there's some problems with anti-gouging laws. Another issue would be, um, you know, maybe we actually need that high price to signal to users uh, or potential users of the good to, uh, to conserve and to not use as much. Uh, therefore, you know, maybe the person that wants the 10 bags of ice to keep their soda cold decides not to buy 10 bags of ice um, that that leaves some left over so that people with more serious uses, baby, baby formula insulin uh, would be able to find some. OK, so that's so that's price gouging. Now, at this point, what I want to do is I want to go back to the minimum wage. So let me go to. Um, let me go to some so, some drawings I had on the board in class. Um, okay, so here's a picture. This is the labor market. So let me sort of unpack this drawing. So we have labor demand right here. We have labor supply. We have a minimum wage. This is a binding minimum wage. Here is our equilibrium wage. Here's our equilibrium number of jobs. What I did, the first thing is I labeled the I labeled consumer surplus. So consumer surplus at the original equilibrium wage would be area A, B, C. Producer surplus at the original equilibrium wage would be D, E. F, G, and F and G would be the costs to suppliers. The suppliers in this case are ordinary people. So F and G would be like people's opportunity cost of their time. Um, H would be the opportunity cost of the time to the people who are not willing to work at the price of P star, but who are willing to work at the price of P lower bar. Okay, so we impose this minimum wage on the market. Now we want to find the quantity demanded at this minimum wage of price P lower bar. Quantity demanded, this is the number of jobs available, is QD at P star, right? So find the minimum wage, where, find where it crosses the labor demand, go all the way down. And I've labeled this right here, this QD, as the number of jobs offered at the minimum wage. How many people want jobs? Well, let's find where... The minimum wage of P lower bar matches the labor supply. And here's QS, the number of people willing to work at the minimum wage. Okay, Well, that's a problem because here, quantity supplied, those willing to work, is bigger than number of jobs available, quantity demanded. right? Now, this is interesting. Let me point out some things here. First thing is we can compare the before and after picture and the effect on consumer surplus. We actually get substantial deadweight loss in this market, right? So area A, B, C was originally consumer surplus. This is actually the value that firms are getting when they hire workers because firms are our labor demand, remember? Firms surplus goes from previously being A, B, C to now just being A. Area B and C, what happens to it? Well, area B now goes to the workers who are employed at this new minimum wage right? So area B and D is this B is capturing like the additional wage benefit to the workers right here that are that were previously employed and that now get a pay increase as a result of the minimum wage. Area C, what happens here? Area C goes to deadweight loss, right? The, the last worker hired is right here. What I've labeled here in red and in blue are corresponding to workers who are not hired at the minimum wage because it's too high. So C goes to deadweight loss. What about E? E was previously producer surplus, it's like income, to the workers who had jobs at the equilibrium price but no longer have jobs at the minimum wage. Right? So C and E are deadweight loss. Some came from producers, some came from workers. Okay. Now let's unpack this surplus here, right? So we had, this is the number of jobs available at the minimum wage. Here's the number of jobs demand or uh, people willing to work at the, will, at the minimum wage. This first group, 
right here in red, these were the workers who lost their jobs as a result of the minimum wage. Let's see if I can slide this over a little bit. Yeah. So these are the workers who lost their jobs and are hurt by the minimum wage, these in red. What about these people in blue? Well, these are those who are willing to work at the minimum wage, but who are unwilling to work at the original equilibrium wage. Why? Well, area H, I should have actually labeled this like J or something. The area under this labor supply curve is the opportunity cost of these workers. And they judged their opportunity cost to be above the equilibrium wage. They weren't willing to work at this price, but now they want to be in the market at the higher price. Now it's worth their time. So the area in blue, these are the workers. Let me slide this over. I don't know. I, this must not be in the picture. So hopefully I got another picture that shows this. This is these are the workers who were unwilling to work at this price, but now are willing to work at the at the minimum wage. Um, these they're also unemployed, but we are less concerned about them because they haven't actually lost as a result of the minimum wage. They didn't lose a job. Okay. All right. So here's sort of a summary of this. Keep that picture in mind. Before the minimum wage, consumer surplus to firms, area A, B, C. Producer surplus to workers, D and E. After the minimum wage, consumer surplus to firms, A. Producer surplus to workers, B and D. The loss to some firms was C and B. C went to deadweight loss, B went to workers, right? B, area B used to be with firms, it was lost by firms and it went to workers in the form of like a pay raise. Some workers lost area E. Area E went strictly to deadweight loss. Okay. All right, so this is essentially the same thing. I'm just saying, oh, area B was lost by firms, transferred to workers, right? This is area B used to be surplus to firms. Now it becomes higher wages to workers. Yeah, I think I have one more picture. Yeah, there's one more picture. Okay, just to get just to get the side of the picture here. So, right. Um, whenever quantity demanded and quantity supplied are not the same, the transacted quantity, that's the actual amount traded, is the smaller of the two. Okay. All right, so go ahead and, and conclude, conclude here.